So, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. This is Amir Tsafati from Galilee, from my house, as you can see. And um, I'm very glad to be online. Uh, yesterday was a very, very historic day. Um, and we are going to address that issue. A lot of people, a lot of Christians, as well as non-Christians, are interested in the, in the meaning of a recognition of America in uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Let me just apologize in advance. I may cough in between. <clears throat> I, I'm battling some, some uh, cold, and uh, I cough from time to time. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm drinking tea with lemon and honey, and hopefully it will, it will help by tomorrow, because tomorrow we have a new group that is arriving in Israel, and I want to be fit and ready in the evening. <coughs> Sorry. Mm. All right. This is the time for us to start. Uh, and um, again, good evening from Galilee, from uh, Israel. This is Amir Salfati, and we are live on Facebook to talk about yesterday's announcement of President Trump regarding Jerusalem. So first of all, let me say that um, many people doubted all over Israel, as well as the Middle East, not to mention the rest of the world, doubted that President Trump will ever do such a thing. And yesterday, I think he proved that he's a man of his word. I believe that um, he's very smart also, because um, on one hand, he recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and he did that 70 years after America was the first to recognize Israel as a sovereign state. Um, but um, at the same time, President Trump yesterday, and that's what many of you don't know, signed the waiver that postpones the move of the embassy for six more months. And the reason why he did that is because there's, there's no way he can move it right now. There's no place, there's no building, and I believe that the next six months will be uh, very busy uh, in order to find the location as well as the contract and the architects to, to work on it. And maybe another waiver will have to be signed in order to reach the point where the embassy can physically move. And until then, I think the Arab world will have enough time to digest this unbelievable uh, move of the United States. And if I may say, it's a move that was cooked in the White House, and it is against the will and the wish of many anti-Israeli um, officials in the State Department in the United States. Thank God we have a good Secretary of State and we have friendly uh, government there, but the State Department officials in America, as well as in the diplomatic corps around the world, especially in the Middle East, are extremely pro-Palestinian, anti-Israeli, and they, just so you know, they kept leaking to the Israeli and the European media um, information or disinformation, or whatever we can call it, that Trump has no agenda, he has he has no um, any. He has no plan for the Middle East, and he's only uh, operating by um, some sort of um, urges rather than a political um, map that he follows. Um, the reason why I'm laughing at all of that is because obviously they never read the platform of the Republican Party, which Trump was elected. Um, as their representative. The, the, the third platform of the Republicans says clearly that Jerusalem is the undivided eternal capital of the Jewish state. So, um, and, and if you remember, Trump promised to the Jewish people as well as to the evangelical establishment that he indeed will move the embassy and will recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Now, let me make it clear. All the... All the uh, U.S. presidents that ever came to Israel came to Jerusalem. They never skipped Jerusalem. They came to the prime minister's office. They came to the parliament. They came to the president's uh, uh, residence. So, and they all acknowledge that Jerusalem is the capital. 
yet they were afraid to take that bold move in officially recognizing it. And um, it all goes back, if I may uh, tell you, um, and many of you probably don't know, but it all goes back to uh, February 12, 1945. Believe it or not, but on that day, um, we know that um, the alliance between America and the Saudis uh, was reached on the Quincy, on board the, the ship called Quincy in, in the Suez Canal. And it, President uh, F.D. Uh, Roosevelt and the Saudi king, the one who founded Saudi Arabia, Abdel Aziz Ibn Saud, they reached an agreement that America is going to protect Saudi Arabia in exchange for Saudi oil. And the, the Saudi monarch, the king, warned America from a recognition of a Jewish state. Just so you know, Roosevelt said he will not act upon it and do anything without consulting first with the Arabs. So the Arabs in 1945, although Israel was a, you know, the Jewish people survived the Holocaust and came from the ashes of the Holocaust, basically um, Ezekiel 37 was fulfilled. The Arabs received a right of veto over a, a Jewish state. And it's very interesting because um, if you think about it, uh, all of that almost kept going on until um, two great presidents in the history of the United States. One is, of course, um, Harry Truman, who against the advice of the State Department and against the wish of the Saudis and against the wish of many European leaders recognized the state of Israel 70 years ago. So that happened with one great leader, which, by the way, I heard today that he was a devout Christian, grew up um, in a Christian home and uh, was probably uh, taught to protect and help Israel. But I also want to tell you that since President Truman, no president reached that level of being mentioned in the history books and being a tool in the hand of God to fulfill Bible prophecy until President Donald Trump. I can, I, I'm sorry I, I, I sound too sensationalist right now, because which I'm normally not. But I want to tell you something. What President Trump did last night is not only an earthquake in the Middle East and the world, but is equal to what President Truman did in 1948. And I believe together these two presidents are expressing the major role that God had um, intended America to play in Bible prophecy. It's nothing less than that. I believe that when people are asking themselves, where is America in Bible prophecy? Let me tell you, America may not be mentioned in Bible prophecy, but it has been greatly used by God in the in these modern days to help establishing the state of Israel, recognizing the state of Israel, protecting the state of Israel, and now recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. I know that for many of you, it's just something that is uh, something that you, you take for granted. You know, Israel exists, Jerusalem is its capital. But for us, the Jewish people, you, you can't take that for granted. Uh, just up until 85 years ago, we were without country and we were persecuted and massacred by the millions, by uh, modern European countries. And up until um, yesterday, no sovereign country officially recognized Jerusalem, the historical capital of Israel, as the capital of the modern state of Israel. What happened yesterday 
literally changed the uh, uh, the whole map. And, and, and let me explain to you how. First of all, to make it very clear, um, President Trump yesterday in his declaration was very clear that what he is recognizing is the obvious thing, is something that everybody knows. Everybody knows Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, and everybody, when they come to visit Israel, they don't demand that the Israeli Prime Minister will see them in Tel Aviv. They go to the Israeli Prime Minister knowing that's the capital of Israel. So President Trump said yesterday, hey, hello, this is a reality check. Jerusalem is the capital, so why can't we just say that? Why are we sticking our head in the sand for all those years? And the second thing he said is this, nothing is being changed. Arabs are praying on the Temple Mount. Jews are praying at the Wailing Wall. Christians can still walk in the streets of the Via Dolorosa. He said nothing has changed. It's not like I declare Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and now the Jews are going to kick out everybody around. This is a lie from the pit of hell. So President Trump basically says, look, let's not pretend. Let's not pretend that it, we don't know that Israel is the cap Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Let's once and for all say that and not be ashamed of that. Now, I know that many of you um, think that this may, this may be a crazy thing. And I, in fact, I think that most of the world think it's a crazy thing. But I'm asking you, how crazy is it for a country to have its capital recognized? I, I, I just don't get it. How come uh, we are the only country that all the embassies are located in a different city than its capital? It's quite frustrating if you really think about it. And I think it's abnormal. I think that if you choose to recognize me as a state, you have to choose my. You have to choose to also acknowledge that my capital is my capital. Now it's very interesting because following President Trump's um, announcement. The Filipino president um, indicated that the Philippines will move its embassy to um, uh, its embassy to Jerusalem as well. You know, people ask me why, of all people, President Rodrigo Duterte said that, and I said because he is probably the only crazier person than uh, President Trump. And when I say crazy, I don't mean bad crazy. I mean good crazy. I mean. Someone who, care, who cares less about the politics of this world and someone who just is doing what is right. You know, Duterte is being uh, criticized some, by, by world media as someone who's killing, um, um, extrajudicial killing. Uh, he's killing, um, you know, drug dealers and all that. I want to tell you something. He, he inherited the most difficult situation ever a president can inherit. And what he's doing right now is reconstructing and he's recovering a country from being a drug addict. And I want to tell you something. It takes that craziness to defeat evil. And it takes that craziness to defeat politically correctness. So Dute I, I wasn't surprised when Duterte said that because that's what it takes. Someone who's not playing the politically correct game and someone who's just looking at reality right there and acknowledging the things that are obvious to everyone. So that's one thing. The Czech Republic, the first European country to acknowledge that uh, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, they actually said, we acknowledge or recognize West Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And some of you might criticize that. Well, I don't criticize that because to me, it's a beginning. To me, if people start moving their embassies, even if it's just the West Jerusalem, I don't care. At least they understand being in Tel Aviv is completely irrational. Now, uh, let's, uh, let's try to understand what happened. President Trump, first of all, promised his people that he's going to do that. It was something that, by the way, was promised by President George W. Bush, but he never... He never um, he never did that. It's something that President Obama said in front of a Jewish audience. I believe Jerusalem is the capital of, of Israel and should never be divided. That's what he said. Yet he lied to everyone by, by obviously not following through. Uh, President Trump said what the other said, but the only difference is he's actually doing what he promised he would do. 
Isn't that interesting that we are angry? People are angry at someone who's actually doing the things he promised to do. It's, I, I think it's disturbing if you're asking me. It's quite uh, unbelievable. Um, I also want to tell you that um, there was an interesting conversation between President Trump and um, an American evangelical pastor. And uh, the pastor um, says that um, when he sat with President Trump and, and explained to him a um, few months ago the whole importance of Jerusalem, he basically said that all the other presidents let us down in this issue. And what are you going to do about it? And he basically, President Trump said, while everybody let you down, I will not do that. Now, that pastor explained that it has to be this year, not next year. And the president asked why. And the pastor said, because it is a year of jubilee. He said it's 50 years from 1917 to 1967, from the Balfour Declaration to Jerusalem's capturing by Israel and reunification. And it's exactly 50 years now from Jerusalem coming to the hand of Israel to the recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. So basically, the year of Jubilee, that uh, Leviticus chapter 25 was a something that was behind the scenes in this whole in this whole thing um, that same pastor told Trump that no matter what the Palestinians Russian British will say Jerusalem is forever a Jewish city because it's a God thing not a man-made thing it's a God godly promise and therefore if Trump wants to be blessed he has to support Israel to follow Genesis 12, and I will bless those who bless you. Believe it or not, we live in 2017. Amazing things are happening right now all around the world with Bible verses being in the mind of a world leader when he's doing the things that he's doing. So, biblical portions are extremely important in the decision making of a president nowadays this is i believe this is amazing um, we believe as a country that we've never had any any uh, greater friend in the white house than president donald trump you know and and the more i see what he's doing the more i admire the fact that he cares less about the dirty rotten politics of Washington, Europe, and even the Arab world. And he's just telling things uh, as they are. By the way, this is why he gains so much uh, respect in the Arab world. When President Trump came all the way to Saudi Arabia, he told the Arab world that it is Islamic terrorism. That word that everybody was so afraid to use, a word that in America and in parts of the, other parts of the world was forbidden to be mentioned even by law enforcement. I, I was in Australia this summer and one of the chief police, uh, chief, one of the chiefs of the police in Melbourne, Australia told me that they cannot use the word Islamic terrorism. Can you imagine? And, and it's interesting because President Trump comes all the way to the heart of the Arab world, Saudi Arabia, and tells the Saudis and all the other countries that sat there, Islamic terrorism is the problem and you need to start dealing with it. You know what? When you talk like that, when you put the situation on the table, then people respect you. And therefore, by the way, guess what? We heard nothing too big and too alarming, neither from Saudi Arabia nor from Jordan, from Egypt, or from the Gulf states. Look, the Palestinians are so shocked right now because no one is too alarmed. Yes, the French president said something and the European Union said something. Even I just heard that uh, the Pope said something and Putin said something, but that, that's it. No one, now they, there was a special, special session tomorrow uh, in the uh, Security Council in the UN, of course, because it has something to do with Israel. Remember, 
Thousands of people can be killed in Libya, in Syria, in Iraq. Nobody's going to talk about them. But God forbid the Jewish people have Jerusalem as their capital and the Security Council has to convene immediately and talk about it and somehow um, uh, refute that. But let me tell you something. The UN has to be very careful because most of its funding comes from the United States of America. And it's about time that somebody draw the line. And President Trump made it very clear. And, and I believe, by the way, I believe that more countries are going to follow President Trump's decision uh, and move their, at least recognize Jerusalem and then move their embassies to Jerusalem. I believe that it took one courageous person to make the first move and for the others to, um, to follow through. And that's what I believe happened with the Czech Republic. I believe we're going to hear more about it also from other countries in, in Eastern Europe. And later on, more countries uh, are going to talk about that. Any country that is completely drenched with politically correctness will definitely not like that. Especially countries that already gave up to Islam, like Germany and France and, and others. These countries cannot even afford supporting such a thing because of their fear from their own Muslim population in their country. Um, so uh, we talked about um, the evangelical move behind the scenes here. To And by the way, that explains why President Trump stood yesterday right next to several Christmas trees, as well as Vice President Pence, who is a devout Christian. And what he did yesterday, yesterday he displayed a Christian America telling the world that they acknowledge the biblical roots of Jerusalem and the affiliation of Jerusalem with the Jewish people based on the Bible. While Christmas trees are behind him, few days after he said that Christmas has to be celebrated with in mind, what Christ did in, 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 in basically reviving the spirit of Christmas in the White House, something that has been killed and choked to death almost over the last eight years. So that was phenomenal what I, what I saw. Now, you know, Vice President Prince is a very devout Christian, is a strong evangelical Christian, part of, of uh, um, prayer meetings and prayer rallies and and one of the biggest supporters of Israel. And uh, I, I want you to know that he, uh, um, yesterday, right after President Trump uh, said what he said, Vice President uh, Pence released uh, a statement. And uh, in that statement, he says, Today, our president took a historic step to make it clear that America stands with our allies, especially our most cherished ally, Israel, and for nearly 20 years, Congress and, and the successive administrations have expressed a willingness to move the American embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, yet more than two decades of talk has resulted in no action until now. President Trump is a man of his word and is committed to keep the promises he made to the American people. Wow! Isn't that amazing? First of all, the acknowledgement that Israel is the most cherished ally of America. And then saying, sorry guys, you better get used to the fact that there is a president in the White House that is actually fulfilling his promises to his voters. That's it. It's, <laughs> you have to get used to that. Now, let me tell you what happened with the Palestinian reactor. First of all, really, and you have to trust me about, I live here. And I know the Palestinian world. I know the Arab world. I, I'm almost a, an expert in, in, in that which is going on around us. And I can tell you, they did not see that coming. When, when, um, when Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian president, uh, heard a rumor that that might be the case, he immediately picked up the phone. He knew, I can say whatever I can say. I'm the darling of, of America. I'm the darling of Europe. I'm the darling of the Arab world. When I say that I'm angry, people immediately change their minds. That's what the Palestinians were used to when Obama was president. That's what they're used to from the European Union and from the rest of the Arab world. Well, guess what happened? Guess what happened? He called President Trump 
And he says, is that true? And President Trump says, yes, it is true. In fact, if we're talking already, let me tell you, not only I'm going to recognize Jerusalem as capital, but I'm going to move the embassy eventually. And um, shocked President Abbas hung up and immediately, in a frantic move, picked up the phone and called Vladimir Putin. He called the Pope. He called the Arab leaders. And all he heard is, wow, that's a bad move. Yeah, we don't think it's going to contribute to the peace. Nobody really said that, you know, we are going to do whatever it takes to change it. And nobody, nobody really uh, lied uh, or, or, or put himself uh, um, on the line for, for, for the Palestinians. And that's the biggest shock that they have. In fact, you can imagine that President Trump would have never announce that without consulting with the Saudis. It's not a coincidence that the Saudis, three days earlier, it was leaked that they said to the Palestinians that they believe that in the future peace plan with Israel, all the settlers in the settlements, the Jewish settlers, will stay. The Palestinian capital will not be Jerusalem, but a, an Arab neighborhood east of Jerusalem called Abu Dis. Can you imagine what, what we're talking about? A Saudi proposal that is telling the Palestinians we are able to live with the fact that Jerusalem is not going to be your capital. And you must understand, you have to separate the two things. Jerusalem as capital of Palestinians as a, as a um, political thing. And Jerusalem is important to Muslims as a religious thing. What President Trump said yesterday, and what he said to the Arab world, I'm not changing anything. The Temple Mount, which is where Al-Aqsa Mosque is, is still, the, you know, Muslims pray there. We, we're not changing anything. But we are declaring Jerusalem as a, as, as, as a capital, and, and the Palestinians better get their act together if they want to sit and continue negotiations. Isn't it interesting that the Saudis had no problem with that. In fact, most of the moderate Sunni world, in light of the conflict between the Shiites and the Sunnis and Iran and the Saudis, right now Israel is actually enjoying from that inner Muslim struggle. The last 10 years were the worst 10 years in the Middle East for the Arabs and for Muslims in particular. We've never had bloodier years than, than the last 10 years. Yet, if you think about it, these were the best years Israel ever had in its history. We, our GDP is now $44,000. You understand that um, we've, that's a giant leap forward. Israel is, is, a, is an innovative state that is now attracting investors from all over the world. Just uh, two weeks ago, Mercedes-Benz opened in a research and develop center in Israel. Not to mention Apple and Google, um, Samsung, not to mention so many, Microsoft. They're all here in Israel. Nobody is afraid. Nobody has a problem. Mobileye, the, one of the leading companies, was purchased for almost $20 billion by Google. Mobileye is situated in Jerusalem. That's its, its headquarters. And, and nobody has a problem with that. You see, the Palestinians were threatening the whole world for too long that unless they get Jerusalem, they will just never have, uh, make sure that the Middle East will be in flames. Well, the Middle East is in flames anyway, without the Palestinians. They understand that their agenda is pushed back now to maybe last on the list. Right now, countries like Saudi Arabia are striving to, to survive against Iran. Right now, you have countries like Lebanon and, 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 and uh, uh, Syria um, that are about to collapse. Right now, you have Libya collapse. You have, um, you have literally, Iraq is, 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 is unstable. All of the Middle East is so unstable that the Palestinians cannot threaten anyone anymore. It is already that bad without you even trying to make it. And so the Palestinians declare three days of rage. Well, two days 
almost passed and nothing really happened. We're bracing right now towards tomorrow. Tomorrow is Friday. It is normally on Friday, they, I guess it's the only religion in the world where you go to the house of God and instead of coming with feelings of repentance, peace, and serenity, you come with feelings of revenge, bloodshed, and, um, uh, and killing. I, I don't understand that. But I can tell you that the Palestinians, they don't even have a very organized plan to do something. We are expecting some riots. We're expecting some riots coming from Gaza. We're expecting some riots maybe around the Temple Mount. But that's it. We, we understand, and they understand, that the world is not going to take um, violence as, as a mean to solve this problem. They've tried that before several times, three different intifadas. And every time they started one, they went back 10 years. And it took them 10 years after the last one, then they started another one, and they went back again. They understand it's not working. Violence won't work. And by the way, let me make it very clear. Israel would have never signed any peace deal with anyone without the acknowledgement that Jerusalem is our capital. So President Trump understood that. He understood, look, for 20 years, the Israelis and Palestinians are sitting and talking, and there is nothing to talk about because it is obvious that the Israelis will never give up on Jerusalem and the Palestinians will never give up on Jerusalem. So unless we acknowledge that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel and put an end to this story, unless th there will never be peace. If we want to advance, the Palestinians need to understand this is Israel's capital. Now, if Israel wants to divide it, if Israel wants to give them a portion of it, Israel can do it. President Trump is also one of the first presidents that is not captured in the mantra of two-state solution. He said yesterday, and I don't know if you noticed that, he said, we will support a two-state solution if the parties will agree on it and want that. In other words, if there will be no agreement for a two-state solution, we're not even going to push for it. Because what's the point? You see, for 20 years, the world is pushing it, and it's not working. Let me make it clear. 1947, the UN voted for two-state solution. And guess who rejected it? It's the Arab side. It's the Palestinian. They wanted everything or nothing. Well, they got nothing. And 50 years later, Again, they play the same card, everything in Jerusalem or nothing. Guess what? They just realized that they got nothing. So I think it's a reality check for them. And it's a sober, I hope it's a sobering moment for them. Um, I also want to tell you that um, the Arab world is divided in its um, reaction to this move. On one side... We have the moderate Sunni world that is really giving a very lukewarm disappointment from this whole thing. But then you have Iran that cannot say anything because Iran will be perceived as, as someone who wants war. So they're sending their proxies, the Hezbollah, to say that this is nothing less than a disaster such as the Balfour Declaration. <laughs> so it's very interesting that they themselves recognize that historic move of President Trump to be as important, as historic, and maybe as devastating for them as the Balfour Declaration from 1917. Um, let's talk about the Turkish reaction. This is very important. Ladies and gentlemen, Turkey plays a significant role in Ezekiel 38 war, and we must address that situation. The Turkish president wants to take advantage of the situation right now. He wants to be the what we call the new caliph. He wants to tell the world, the Sunni world, look, Saudi is, is really uh, stuttering. They, they don't really take the leadership in, in, in coming against such a move. Well, I will not allow such a thing to happen. And he already called... Jerusalem, the way he called it, Kudus. Um, he knows that um, once he touches such a thing, he can great, he can achieve great support and 
and and and and uh, maybe some some glory from Muslims. And uh, what he did yesterday is um, he basically uh, said, guys. Um, this is playing with fire. It's not going to end well, and uh, we may even have to cut on severe all uh, relations with Israel. In order for Turkey to come against Israel and attack Israel, Turkey first must no longer be friends with Israel. Turkey must completely disengage from its relations with Israel, and I believe this is a, a the moment that it can happen. I believe that. The declaration not only brought Jerusalem back to the table in a huge way, but it also separated the Middle East in a way that um, you can you can understand better how Ezekiel's prophecy will be fulfilled. So far, we always talked about Turkey being a part of the alliance with Iran and Russia, but guess what? Turkey has relationship with Israel. Turkey has diplomatic relations with Israel, military ties with Israel. And if I may say, this declaration might be the cause for the Turks to say enough is enough. We want now to express our rage and we want now to, to show the Muslim world that we, the Ottomans, those who were the caliphate in the 18 and the 17 and the 1600s, we are back in the scene. Erdogan has been working on his image from just prime minister, first then to president, to sultan um, for, for the longest time. And this is his time. This is his time to just throw words and, and, and cause fire to be bigger and get the incitement going on for, 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 for his own benefit. Only in Istanbul you have great, great... Um, demonstrations against what happened. Um, you couldn't find it anywhere else. The only place around the world we saw something strange was in Amsterdam when there's one Arab guy dressed with Palestinian flag that attacked a kosher Jewish restaurant and broke its windows. That's all. Can you imagine? Now again, as I said, um, we, so we talked about the Turkish, we talked about the Arab, we talked about the Palestinian reaction. They're shocked. They don't know what to do. Um, again, tomorrow might be a day of rage. Tomorrow might be a violent day. We're not sure, but they understand right now. They understand that for the long run, violence will not serve their purpose. You may not know that, but um, there's another thing that happened yesterday that um, was a big blow to the Palestinians. Um, and, and that is, of course... Um, the fact that um, um, Congress passed a bill, in fact, I think that the C Committee for Foreign Affairs um, in the Senate advanced a bill called um, the Taylor Force Bill. Taylor Force was a, a U.S. Um, Marine um, that after he, he had several tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, he got out of the military and he went to study in the uh, Vanderbilt University. And uh, in one of the vacations, he came to Israel and a Palestinian terrorist uh, killed him in Tel Aviv. And uh, it's, a, it's a terrorist attack that uh, wounded 11 people and uh, killed one. And it was him. And it's interesting because um, the State Department and the U.S. government, then, while Obama was still president, found out that... Um, the Palestinian uh, president and the Palestinian government pays money to the family of the terrorist who killed Taylor Force. And so a bill was proposed in 2016 to stop all funding to the Palestinian Authority until they stop funding terrorist families. And guess what? Three days ago, that happened. The, the U.S. Senate is 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 has approved it and it's going to become a bill and and the palestinians are going to lose 300 million dollars all the money that they receive from america and they just steal it to themselves or give it to terrorists it's going to be gone so the palestinians understand we only have we only have to lose here in this whole situation and um it's a big blow it's a it's an earthquake 
Let me tell you that. It's an earthquake. And uh, I'm going to tell you this. Um, it, the, the embassy is not going to move. At least not in the... I don't believe it's going to move within the next year even. Uh, it takes six months to just plan and, and architect. It, it takes more to to approve things and fix things. By the time the embassy will move, maybe Trump will come to the end of his first term. And uh, But the declaration by itself is a very symbolic act. Now, I want to make it very, very clear. The Bible promised that it's not Damascus that will be a problem for all the nations, but Jerusalem will be a problem for all the nations. Damascus will be destroyed. Isaiah 17 verse 1, it, it, we know that. And we already discussed that a few days ago when I was on Facebook Live telling you that the Iranians are planning now to build their military bases inside Damascus because they understand if it's outside, it's easy for Israel to destroy it. So Damascus is already preparing itself to be a target for Israel because we're not going to tolerate American entrenchment militarily. You understand that? So what, what, what happens is it's Jerusalem that is becoming a cup of poison. It's Jerusalem which is the problem of the whole world. Think about it. A recognition in a, in, a, in a capital of a country gets all the way to the UN Security Council, to the Pope, to the leaders of all the major empires and all over the world. It shakes the world and it's just a city within Israel. It's a city that goes all the way back 3,000 years ago when David took it from the Jebusites and turned it into the capital of the Jewish people. We found coins from that time. We found um, little um, um, clay seals from that time. We found the foundation of David's palace. We found everything from that period. So, you know, you, you can argue with many things, but not with archaeology, not with facts. We found stuff from the time of King Solomon. We found stuff from the time of the, the kings that followed Solomon. We found evidence to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians in, in 586 BC. We found evidence to the return of the Jews and the restoration of the walls by Nehemiah. We found in the heart of the Jewish quarter the broad wall that Nehemiah in chapter 3 verse 8 mentioned that he restored. We found... Um, the Jerusalem that the New Testament is, is is talking about, and in the New Testament, by the way, for those of you who may not know, it's a Jewish city. We found the remains of the destruction caused by the Romans. And all of these events were hundreds of years before Islam was ever born. So saying by the UN that Jerusalem has no connection to the Jewish people, and that the Temple Mount has no connection to the Jewish people, this is baloney. And right now, you know, the Bible says, truth shall spring out of the earth. And indeed, archaeology is, is supporting all of that. But the world it chooses to stick its head in the sand. And it takes one bold leader to change things around. And I'm so proud of him. I'm also proud of the Filipino president that is going to push forward with his plans to move the embassy. And I'm proud of other countries that I know are going to follow through this whole thing. I want to tell you that the Arab world is so shocked that I myself, on Behold Israel, on, on my Facebook and my website and Instagram, I've been um, approached with horrible words and threats by many Muslims uh, from Arab countries such as Tunisia and Morocco and Libya, as well as uh, the Arab uh, the Arab part, not the, not the uh, Northern African one, and because they're very shocked, they're, 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 they can't, they, they don't understand how did that thing happen to us. Um, uh, let me tell you about the Israeli reaction. The Israeli reaction. Okay, so our media, which I call them the Medianites, they are, <laughs> they're very liberal. They would only scare the people that the worst is about to happen. This is the most irresponsible. Think about it. Israelis are apologizing to the Arab world that somebody recognized Jerusalem as our capital. But these are the media. Most of the politicians in Israel understand that there is a consensus in the, in the Israeli 
um, public regarding Jerusalem. And so the politicians are very, very scared to say anything bad about this decision. The president of Israel praised Donald Trump for, for what he did. Even the leaders of the opposition in Israel praised that recognition. Now, it's very interesting that um, in Israel we have, um, you know, we, we, we have the media that is completely detached from the, from the public, but the public is in love with President Trump. Uh, yesterday on the walls of Jerusalem, they, they uh, projected the flags of America and Israel. It, it was amazing. And yesterday, uh, pictures of Trump liberating the Wailing Wall, uh, it's, it's sort of a, a, a photo montage of, 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 of uh, pictures that were taken at the 67 war when we released the Wailing Wall from the hands of the Arabs. He's being admired by the Israelis. And I want to tell you something, guys. Um, the Lord said that he will bless those who bless Israel and he will curse those who curse Israel. The, world, the Lord never said, I will bless you if you follow the world's agenda. The, world, the Lord never said, uh, you have to take care of the feelings of everybody around all the time. And the Lord said, not only that he will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel, but the Lord said, that any nation that ever divided the land of Israel and Jerusalem and the people of Israel will be severely judged. Where? It's a very ironic thing. It's going to be, the judgment is going to be in Jerusalem, in the valley of Jehoshaphat, known as the Kidron Valley. That's what the prophet Joel chapter 3 talked about. The Lord is going to bring all the nations, and believe me, all the nations is, is all the nations, is because... 99% of the world is not recognizing Jerusalem as capital. And, and, and uh, the Lord is going to judge. He's going to judge them, not according whether they believe in Jesus or not. Believe it or not, nations will be judged according to what they did to Israel, to the land, and to the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, by the way, is the only place on planet Earth that the Lord said, I put my name upon this city. By the way, if you ever come to Israel with me, I'm going to show you the model of Jerusalem. It's a half an acre model of what Jerusalem looked like. And we're going to see that the valleys of Jerusalem create the Hebrew letter Shin. That is the letter that starts the, the name Shaddai, El Shaddai, the, the name of God. So literally God has engraved his name in the valleys of Jerusalem. So, you know, anyone who touches Jerusalem is going to get hurt because you can't touch it. You can't divide it. You can try but you're going to get hurt. You can try, but you're going to be judged. You can try, but you're going to lose. You're going to be defeated. Now, you can, you can think, maybe, that you can make it, but that's fine. But I can tell you, up front, you won't make it. Because the Bible is clearly indicating that the enemies of Israel and, the, and those who come against Jerusalem, read Zechariah. The prophet in chapter 12 and 13 and 14 describes how at the end of the tribulation, the world will come against Jerusalem. And, and in fact, isn't that interesting? That it's interesting because um, at the very end, the Bible says, Zechariah 14, all those nations that will survive that war, known to us as Armageddon, but it's not really in Armageddon, it's in Jerusalem, those who will survive will have to come every year to Jerusalem to celebrate what? The Ramadan? No. Christmas? No. Easter? No. To celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Lord said, if a nation, let's say Egypt, will not come, then the blessing of God won't be upon them. Then there will be no rain upon them. God is very much zealous when it comes to Jerusalem, when it comes to Israel, and when it comes to his plans for the Jewish people, and through the Jewish people. And so I, I, if I have to say something, is what happened yesterday was nothing less than historical, but nothing also less than, than I believe, a, um, a biblical um, move to bring Jerusalem back to the table, and to separate the nations based on the Jerusalem issue.
it's extremely important. It's, it's, it's quite amazing. And um, I'm, I'm quite uh, amazed at this whole thing. Um, we may see some perilous times. We may see some, some shaking in the Middle East because of this. Things might go south. Things might go a little bit out of control. But I'm going to tell you something. No matter what men is doing, God is in full control. And God knows all of those things. And a word of, of encouragement to the believers that are watching this right now. Look, the Middle East is getting ready. Jerusalem is getting ready. Europe is getting ready. Are you ready? They're all blind. They don't understand the promises of God for us, for you. They don't know that. They don't understand that. They mock God. They mock the Word of God. They don't relate to it. You, We have the promise of God that when we see these things, we lift up our eyes and we see that our redemption indeed is drawing near. I want to encourage all of you. Uh, some of you are tired. Some of you are saying, how, how long can we be here and endure all of that? Well, this race requires endurance. This race requires perseverance and I can assure you that we are the generation that have seen more prophecies fulfilled than any other generation since the time of Jesus Christ. How dare we complain that it's too much? You know, can you imagine almost 1800 years of almost silence when it comes to Bible prophecy? Silence. Can you imagine people who lived in the 1400, 1500, and 1600? They may have held on to the promises of God, but they've never seen it happening the way we see it. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 that as we see, we see the day is approaching. We, we see that. The day indeed is approaching. And we don't have to think about it and hope for it. We see it. We are the generation that see it. So I want to encourage you. These are amazing days. These are great days. These are exciting days. And these are the days that um, we need to stay close to God. These are the days not to forsake our fellowship, as Hebrews 10 says. These are the days to, to esteem one another and, 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 and help one another and not to... Not, not to fight with one another, not to envy one another, not to, uh, not to slander one another. These are the days where we need to stick to the solid Word of God and not to have itching ears to hear some watered-down uh, 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 gospel that has no mentioning of hell and no mentioning of sin and no mentioning of the, re the, the basic thing that man needs to do and needs to repent. These are the days that we need to stick to the Bible, serve the Lord wherever we are, not forsake our fellowship, esteem one another, and, and preach the gospel to our family, to our friends, to our city, in our country. This is it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Actually, I did better than I thought. Uh, I thought I'll, I'll be coughing all day, but it's, it's, it's pretty good. I just sneezed twice, so I'm fine. Again, uh, I want to encourage you. I believe, look, it might sound a little um, boasting, and I don't want to sound like that. But I want to tell you something. I'm offering you with Behold Israel boots on the ground. In other words, living here, being with my feet on the ground in Israel, in Galilee, in Jerusalem, in the Israeli military, in the Israeli politics, understanding the politics of the Islamic world and the Arab world all around me. I want to encourage you to um, follow us on, on Facebook and follow us on YouTube because we give you unfiltered, direct from the place, from the region, not only the news, but also the biblical uh, um, significance of all of them. I'm literally, I feel almost like, um, almost like called for such a time as this. 
and and uh, I, I, I maybe that's why I, I don't seem to be able to rest nowadays. It's because I I feel that there is so much that is going on, and there is so much deception, and there's so much inaccuracy, and there's so much sensationalism in the Christian world to make things bigger than they are and to not understand the things that are really happening. So I just want to encourage you to to subscribe to our YouTube channel, to follow us, to get our newsletter if you go to beholdisrael.org and subscribe. Follow me on, if you want some nice pictures, follow me on, on Instagram. It's Behold Israel, one word. And I took some great pictures of a of a rainbow above the Sea of Galilee yesterday, and and more and more things that are to come. And um, uh, we we just want to stay in touch with you, but we also want you to be able to not only get those things, but do me a favor, share them. That's more important. It's only one click, but you're getting so many people enlightened and and and, and educated with things that, for the most part, your media in wherever country you are will never, ever tell you. So thank you again for listening to me. And let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your great faithfulness. We thank you for much, uh, so much for, for standing with your people, Israel, for, with, you, with the city of Jerusalem. Thank you for President Trump and for his boldness to, to do the right thing and not to be afraid of a world that is so politically correct yet so blind. Father, I thank you, and I pray that you will also um, uh, protect and, 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 and guard and, and shield Israel in these days that are not only exciting and historical, but also perilous days. I also pray, Father, for the people who uh, watch this uh, video, that you give them a sense of encouragement, that you are not only in full control, but you have such a great future for all of us. We thank you that no eye could see, no ear ever heard. It never came to anyone's mind the goodness that you have prepared for all of your children. We thank you for your promises. Thank you that you promised that you're about to come and receive us unto yourself. So wherever you are, Jesus, we will be also. Thank you, Father, that you never destined us to the wrath of God. We thank you. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. Shalom from Galilee. And um, I love you all. Shalom. God bless you. Bye-bye.